don't be unduly alarmed when your kids express distress. They should be sad about moving. It's expectable. It's healthy. If a kid's like, oh, I feel sad. I'm going to miss this. I'm not sure. I feel scared of what's ahead. Negative emotions are part of life. What matters is just the kids handle them well. Episode 169, How Do I Move Without Damaging My Kids? You know, it's a time of the year where I just can see summer. I can see summer, but like the month of May, there is so much happening. I just need to get to summer, Lisa. In schools, we call it 100 days of May. Oh, I like that. (laughs) Because it just feels like that. Like it goes on and on and on and on. Everybody's desperate for summer. Is that what it is? Like we can see the finish line that it makes Uh it even longer? Yeah. And then, you know, like there's all that stuff thrown in. There's all, you know, like the concerts and the extras and the whatever. I mean, it's great. And also like, I think everybody's just trying to like check every box to yeah. get out the door. Absolutely right. Yeah, absolutely right. You know, one of the things that several of our listeners brought to our attention is this time of year also moving happens, big moves, some mm-hmm. expected, some not. We know there's been a lot of transition for so many families over the past few years. So we wanted to take up this note about moving, this email that we got. Dear Dr. Lisa and Rena, this summer, my husband and I and our three kids are moving to another state. My husband's been offered an exciting new job. I'll continue working remotely and we'll be closer to both sides of our extended family. My kids are 13, 11, and 8. They are all having a difficult time with the news. My 13-year-old girl will be a freshman at a new high school in the fall, so I understand why she's so upset. She's also worried that her current friends will forget her and that she won't make any new friends. My 11-year-old has gotten very close to a few great kids and thought that this would be our forever home. My youngest, a boy in second grade, and obviously in a different developmental age, was shocked and devastated too. He initially did beg us to change our minds. Since then, he's been mostly fine, on the surface at least. I remember my friends being my everything in the tween and teen years. How can I help my kids through this transition? Does moving at a young age have implications for life that we might not realize? Are there creative and special things that we could do to say goodbye? Since this move will be a loss and a grieving process for them. I'm inclined to share with them some of my feelings, what I'll miss and what I'm excited about, but I don't want to overwhelm them. Please help us with this process. We are so grateful for your approach to parenting. A lot to dig into here. I guess, where exactly do you think the parents should start? Well, here's a question I actually have for you, Rena. Did you move as a kid? No, we were lucky enough to sort of live in the same, I mean, we did move houses, but it was all in the same school district. So it never okay. really mattered. I moved a ton as a kid. Really? Yeah. So I was born in Denver, lived there till I was six, moved to London for a year and a half, and then moved from London to Chicago for three years, and then moved back to Denver, but a different part of Denver and a different, you know, I was much older. And so it was like basically like starting again. Were you just devastated every well, day? How did you cope if you were moving so much? I coped I think fine, but I I sort of feel like I need to like give full disclosure about like being a kid who moved a ton and that has without question informed how I think about questions like this. And so just to like lay my cards on the table, it was disruptive. I think there's a lot families can do to make it better for kids. But one of the questions in the letter is like, what does this mean for kids' development? Okay, Rena, what it meant for me is that going to college was like a non-issue. I was like, oh yeah, I'm just moving again. Like Mm. the idea of starting over and beginning again and having to create a whole new universe and a whole new set of friends. By the time I was going to college, I had done that multiple times times. And I think you'll hear like military kids will say Mm -hmm. this, you know, Mm -hmm. that they are just so good at transitioning. And so military kids and not exactly, but my experience sort of on the high end of how much moving is happening for kids as they are growing up. Mm -hmm. But at that high end, most people's experience, I think at least, you know, mine and as people talk about it is you get really good at making transitions. Mm -hmm. Like you just adapt to it. 
military kids are such a great example, but I also feel like there's a fabulous community of, of support as yeah. you're moving. That's true. Um, and people going through the same thing, where often when you're just by yourself and you're picking up and moving, I think one of the big things that parents worry about is, is this going to be scarring, especially in the yeah. teen years? Are they not going to make any friends? Are they going to be loners? Like, where, what would your advice be if parents realize they're on the cusp of something that could be fabulous for their family, but their kids aren't taking it that way? And it's hard to see yeah. Yeah. Okay. So first thing to know is that moving falls into the range of things that happen in family life, right? This is not some outer limit should be avoided at all costs aspect of human beings, right? I mean, it's just, it's natural that sometimes we move and sometimes we have to pick up and start again. And you're right, start again in communities where we may be the only one starting again, maybe unlike a military community. And so kids are coming into settings where there are established friendships or things like that, that may be harder to break into. The key thing that adults need to know under these conditions is that it's about us helping our kids through it being sensitive to their experience, being aware of the ways in which it's hard, that's what makes a difference. And we can get our kids through almost anything, even things that are not sort of more natural to family life, if we are plugged in, tuned in, loving and attentive as this letter writer obviously is. Mm. Can we go through the ages? Because it's really interesting. These are, I feel like three, the teen, tween, and sort of elementary age groups. Can we, can you just tell us, starting off with the high schooler, what really helps in this moment? Because it's very scary. It is scary. Um, Okay. So as much as this kid is anxious about starting over, it's not the worst thing in the world to have this wonderful juncture of starting in the ninth grade, right? That there's sort of, you know, a lot of times there's some fluidity in ninth grades, new kids coming into a school. It's not necessarily that kids go in lockstep from eighth to ninth grade, even while staying in the same community. And I think for the parent to think about it, I think there's some actually real benefits to sort of a reset button at points in development. Mm. I live in a community where a lot of kids stay in the same schools or same school districts from K through 12. Mm -hmm. And when I moved here, I was like, oh my gosh, that's so weird. But like, what about the dumb thing you did in kindergarten? Everybody still knows where I had the benefit of like, every few years, I just started in a new community Mm -hmm. and my past was my past. And so not that the parents should try to say it to the kid this way, and I'll say why. Mm -hmm. But I think in the parent's mind, they can take some comfort in the knowledge that There's something to be said for getting to start fresh as you begin ninth grade, right? That you are your own person, whatever you did or didn't like about your middle school experience, like now that's in another state far away and you do get to begin again. So I think that there's value in that. That said, and I would say this across the board for all of the kids, we're going to focus on the highlights and the positives for the parent to feel reassured. I think we want to be really careful about trying to sell these things to our kids, I think that when our kids are expressing their worries and anxieties, you know, and I'm thinking especially here about the eight-year-old, I think when parents are like, it's going to be great. Usually what I've seen in my experience is that entrenches the kid in their position of like, you don't understand. Because uh, they feel there's a lack of empathy. Exactly. Despite how positive you are. Like, you just don't get me right You now. don't get it, right? And the parents are like, but it's a better school and they've got better mm-hmm. lunch and you're going to walk fewer places and have more, you know, like, mm-hmm. I mean- Kids are like, you're not tuning in to how I feel about this. So what I would say across the board is be very, very careful about trying to do the hard sell. And in fact, I believe in lowballing it, right? I believe in saying, even to the ninth grader, where I think timing is actually pretty great for starting over, I think it is um, helpful to say, like, of course you're anxious. And, you know, you know what you're giving up. You don't know what you're getting. Um but maybe some of it'll be okay, right? Something like that measured can actually keep the door open to the kid being into it. So tell me a little bit more about lowballing it, because I get it that you can set these expectations and have them lower and then have them happier that they were they surpass them. Is that a good strategy? I think it can be. I think it can be. And I think the way we want to picture this is there might be a part of the kid that's excited right? A part of the kid that's interested in the novelty of the move. And the kid themselves is torn. Part of them wants to stay in the familiar Mm -hmm. and the known, and part of them may be excited about these new possibilities. And what you want is to make space for both of those parts of your kid to come to the fore. 
if you pick up the like, but it's going to be great, mm. they then feel like an equal measure. They have to put up the, but I'm losing all this stuff. Whereas if you stay a little more neutral and are like, yeah, I get it, that it's a lot to give up and you don't know what you're getting and some of what you're getting in the end may be okay, it lets the kid hold both sides at the same time of both being anxious about leaving and excited maybe about what's coming. So tone matters. Yeah. Mm. Walk me through the middle schooler and the elementary school, what they might be going through. You know, middle school is hard, right? Because kids are working so hard to establish their friendship groups and are so often anxious about who they're connected to. And it's because they're loosening their ties to us at home. What's cool about high schoolers, and I'm thinking about this one, she'll also be able to stay in touch with all her old friends, often through digital technology and keep that backup social group and have a new social group. And she likely has a pretty well-established group. It sounds like she does. Whereas a lot of middle schoolers, especially post-pandemic, they're still kind of in flux and they're still on like, you know, kind of um, uneven ground when it comes to their social lives. And so I can really feel for this kid who's like, ah, I'm losing something and I'm walking into a middle school. Yeah. Um, I mean, being a brand new kid in a middle school, as much as it means you get to leave your elementary school experience behind, I can sure understand why there may be a lot of anxieties about starting again at that age. Mm -hmm. And the elementary school child who in this letter appears to be doing well despite protesting at first, are they good at explaining how they're feeling at a moment? Is it masked? I, I, I sense a little bit of doubt from the parent here that are they really processing this okay? Yeah. No, it sounds like there's sort of an immediate like, no, no, say it's not true. Yep. And then the kid has sort of adapted. Yep. So- I think it's an interesting equation, right, to think through about um, that kid getting sort of vocally upset. And I think it sometimes happens in families where one kid does the emotional work for all the kids or from some of the other kids, right? So I do wonder, actually, if part of what this little guy was doing Maybe because he's, you know, less guarded or, you know, had more kind of immediate access to his emotions, is if he was expressing for everybody, like, wait, stop, say it isn't true. And um, because he was taking up that space and doing the work, the older kids sort of stand back and let him do it. So you've done this emotional work and processing it. How do you know if that child is okay? That's a tough one, right? Because it sounds from the letter like maybe it's, you know, quieted. And so then the question is, is the kid over it or has it gone underground, right? Like that's the concern that a parent would have in this moment. And my advice is wait and watch, right? It may be that he had his big experience, shared a lot of distress, took care of it for a lot of people in being open about his distress, and then sort of got past it, is ready to move on, got through and out of that feeling and is looking forward to that what's next. Or it may be that he feels like he's got to be a good good guy and on the team and is sort of setting his distress to the side. So I would watch, watch for what you're seeing. And if the parent feels like he's being way too cheery about this, right? Or way too, like, it, like where did it go? Like, it doesn't make sense that he is as upbeat about the move as he is or seems to not mind it as much as he does. One thing a parent can do, and this works especially well with a younger kid, is to say something like, you know, usually when kids move, they have mixed feelings. You know, part of them is excited about what's ahead, and part of them is really sad about what they're saying goodbye to. So just putting it on the table for the kid so to pick it up. That's an entry point by yeah. saying, asking them about that. Yeah. And, and I love the construction of like, often kids feel because you're not saying, listen, buddy, come on, let's be honest. Like, aren't you sad about this? Right. I mean, you're not like, you know, cigarette and like lamp in their face trying to get them to like confess, yeah. right, that they yeah. feel bad. But you are saying, often kids feel this and you're the one introducing it. And then where it can go from there is that some kids are like, eh, actually, I'm really okay about it. Like that that opens the conversation. Some kids will say, well, actually, now that you're mentioning it, I'm really feeling worried about, you know, missing my the pool we go to, missing the, you know, who knows what will be on their minds. And some kids will feel enough comfort from the parent voicing it. Some kids will just feel like, okay, you get it. 
You're saying it in your words. I don't want to engage it any further than that. Mm. But you're letting me know that you are tuned in to the fact that this is hard for me. Mm. And wordlessly will feel some relief. I like that language that you use by just saying, often kids feel as an entry point to get in. That's really good. Yeah. That's we call it good. displacement is actually the technique in psychotherapy. Um, you know, and it's funny with little, little kids who I haven't cared for in my practice forever, we'll often use like toys and animals. Like I have a huge collection of plastic toy animals and it would be like, you know, here's the grumpy lion and here's the, <laughs> the, the, you know, the cub who's moving, you know, and we'll do it that way. And you can have a very rich conversation as long as you keep it off of the kid. Often kids feel, I'm going to mm-hmm. steal that. I like that. I like that a lot. It works. And again, the reason it works, like the goal of helping kids manage emotions is to get him into language, right? That's what verbalization does, right? It, it takes a feeling, puts it into words. And as soon as a feeling is in words, first of all, it's less intense and it's shared and it's understood. And it's great if the kid can be the one using the language of saying, I feel sad about leaving. I'm worried I'm going to miss my friends, right? All of that language. It's not a too far second best if the parent is the one using the language on behalf of the kid. Sometimes kids feel sad. Sometimes kids feel worried about missing their friends. As long as the feelings are getting into words somehow, somewhere, Mm -hmm. things are going in the right direction. So Lisa, what are the don'ts? When you're moving, absolutely do not do this. Um, So number one, back to do not be like, it's going to be great. Mm -hmm. Like, Don't take that side of things you're asking for your kid to entrench themselves and how not great it is. I think another don't is don't be unduly alarmed when your kids express distress, right? They should be sad about moving, right? It would actually be weird if kids were like, thank God we're moving. We've been wanting to get out of this town for years, right? Like Mm -hmm. we don't want that reaction. So it's expectable. It's healthy. If a kid's like, oh, I feel sad. I'm going to miss this. I'm not sure. I feel scared of what's ahead. Back to how you know how I love to define mental health. It's not about having a sense of feeling good all the time. It's about having feelings that fit the situation and managing them well. So I think when parents are anxious that they're going to harm their kids with a move, and then when kids are saying, oh, gosh, like this isn't what I want, or I'm really worried or sad, I think it would be easy in that anxiety for a parent to think, oh, my gosh, what are we doing? This is not okay. You're having a negative emotion. This is a bad thing. No. Negative emotions are part of life. What manage what matters is just the kids handle them well. I think saying that sometimes to your kid can make such a difference because for so long I, I thought you've always got to be high. You've always got to be up, up, up. And mm-hmm. if you're not up, something is wrong. And it wasn't really until recently, really when we started doing this podcast that I realized, no, you don't need to always be up. And if you're not, mm-hmm. if you're not even in the middle, it's okay too. That feeling Absolutely. that range is important. Absolutely. And And so a kid comes to you and says, I'm really sad about the move. You can say, well, of course you are, right? We've lived here, you've lived here your whole life. You've got a lot of memories tied to this place. You can actually, like, I'll see you and I'll raise you. You know, like, mm. you're sad, of course you're sad. Um, there are things we can do to help you feel better, but sad is the right reaction, right? Mm-hmm. Like, that's what I would say. Don't try to chase the feeling away. Don't feel unduly guilty about the fact that the kid yeah. is having a negative reaction. I think that um, we want to send the message always in parenting, that our kids are going to have painful emotions and they can handle them. And the way we send that message is we make it clear that we can handle their painful emotions too. We talked a little bit earlier, but just overall, Lisa, is this kind of disruption lasting? Is it bad? Is there anything that the parent should keep in mind when you know this is a big disruption? I think it can be. But I think a lot of what it comes down to is how the parent handles it and things that are well within the parent's control. So I do think if it is done very abruptly, if there's very little attention to the kid's experience, right, if it's done, and by abruptly, I mean, it's like, oh, guess what? We're moving tomorrow, right? I think it's really nice to have runway. I think it's really nice to be able to prepare and plan for leaving. Um, I think as long as, you know, adults are attentive to the kid's experience, care about what it feels like for them, go, you know, make a point of trying to soften the experience while being very emotionally attuned to their kid, Mm -hmm. it doesn't have to be problematic at all and could, in fact, build resilience and adaptability and, you know, an appreciation for novelty in the kid. 
it can be handled badly through abrupt or unfeeling approaches from the adults involved. And yeah, I think that that could leave a, leave a mark. The parent here is asking, they want to share some of their emotions they're going through, but they just realize it might be too much at this moment. What's your advice? I do think there's value in parents normalizing negative emotions, even around choices they themselves are making, right? So I think the parent can say, you know, I feel sad too. Um, We feel ambivalent about this move. On balance, we think it's a good thing. That's why we're making it. I think the only time I would be hesitant about an adult sharing their emotions with their kid is if it feels out of control, right? So if if I'm sobbing and I just can't keep my... And it's like, oh my God, mom. It's scary to kids, right? I mean, they want to see us have feeling like within some bounds that feel um, reassuring to them that the parent is really still okay. If the parent is not okay, if they are having so much anger or so much sadness that it it really, um, they seem sort of highly dysregulated. I'm not saying they can't have those feelings. I would hope that they could try to have those feelings where they could get some support and manage them so that when they're with their kids, they can express emotion in a more contained way. A real light bulb moment for me was reading your latest book, The Emotional Lives of Teenagers, where you talk about dads. And you show the research why it is so important that dads talk about their emotions too. Yep. And we're thinking about this eight-year-old who happens to be a boy. And if this is a heterosexual couple making the move, one thing I would say for sure is we don't want all the feelings work to be coming from the mom right? It can happen in the division of labor and families. We see this in the research. Moms are the ones who talk about feelings. And that can entrench for boys the idea that feelings are a girl thing. Mm. So if this is a heterosexual couple and there's a mom and dad involved, I think that this is a great time. Again, I'm making puns these days for the dad to do some of the heavy lifting around the move, (laughs) right? (laughs) And um, talk very openly about his own feelings about moving. And of course, as adults, we have lots of feelings about moving. So it's a choice moment. It's a perfect moment. Um, And do that especially in front of his son. So what I think I'm hearing from you saying this episode is that you don't want to be over the top. You want to be real with them, meet them where they're at so they don't go the opposite direction. Uh, You don't want to lose your emotions no matter what you're feeling. You want to be in control of your how you're feeling, but also sharing what you're going through could help the situation as well. Absolutely. And then there are other things we can do that make a big difference. Kids can handle anything, almost anything, if they have warning and preparation. You said this about funerals too. A hundred percent. seasons ago, that why it was so important to tell them what they will expect. Exactly. So minimize surprises. So as soon as you have a sense of like, here's when the moving truck is coming, if a moving truck is coming, or here's where we're going to stay as we make the move, you know, or just keeping kids in the loop about the details makes a big difference. Like the move itself was a shock of its own. Any sort of other shocks that can be turned into not shocks because kids know what's happening definitely do that. And then another thing, the parent asked about like, is there something we could do to make it better? Or some like, was it like some, you know, some way that we can address it? I think, especially with these age kids, involve them in this question. Like, how do you want to remember our house? Or what do you want to do? What would you like to take with you? Do you want to go take photos of every room and make a album Mm. of the house that you grew up in. You know, like I like that. Yeah. yeah, But like throw that idea out, but they'll be like, no, we wanna, you know, I mean, and who knows what they're gonna come up with. But if it's within reason, again, what you're doing is you're giving them some say, some control in a situation that's not actually going the way that they themselves had thought it would. So any way that we can hand that over to them by involving them and making choices about how to soften this or hold on to this Mm. can go a long way. This was great. And I know it's it's coming from someone who's moved quite a bit, Lisa. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. What is your, because you've survived and you're thriving, not just survived, right? But I also wonder now knowing you, I did not realize you had that many moves. I knew you moved a couple of times, but moving that often, I also feel like anything that's thrown your way, you're like Ninja Chop. You can do it like without even realizing it. You know, I, I wonder if that helps people who move become more able to deal with conflict. Well, it's interesting. I think, um, you know, there's just this issue of like coping, right? Coping. It's not Mm -hmm. the challenges, it's our coping, 
mm-hmm. that we, you know, the challenges are a done deal. Like everybody's going to have their own. It's a question of coping. And, you know, I don't know. I feel like I just got lucky in that my coping was, you know, adequate to what was um, thrown my way. But I think that's how we want to think about these situations. Like kids are going to face challenges. We're going to have disruptions in family life. It's not the challenge. It's the coping and, and helping our co- kids cope well. Giving them that coping skill, what yeah. helps? Is it talking it through? Is it How do you help them establish good coping? I mean, this is like such a beautiful moment, right, in family life because they're going to need it. So on the list of good coping, talking about their feelings, distracting themselves from time to time when they don't want to think about it. I'm wondering if that's what the eight-year-old boy is up to right now. He's like, oh, I don't want to think about this right now. Mm-hmm. Okay, for a little while, that's fine. Um, comforting themselves. Problem solving is a form of coping. So the high schooler who's like, you know what? I need to know that next summer I'm coming back and visiting my friends, right? That is coping. That is problem solving as part of coping. That's what we want to see. Mostly it's what we don't want to see. We don't want to see kids who are horrible to other people because they're so upset about the move. We don't want to see kids who are horrible to themselves because they are so upset about the move. We don't want to see our older teenagers look at substances as a way to try to get relief from their distress. As long as kids are coping in ways that bring relief and do no harm, they're getting it right. So Lisa, what do you have for us for parenting to go? You know, Rena, there are times in parenting where we make a choice that works well for the adults that it is actually not the choice the kids want. And we can run into friction with our kids about it. And I have learned over the years that the best thing to do is to acknowledge that. And so I think in a situation like this, if the kids are having a really hard time with it, rather than being defensive about it, the parent might say, listen, we're making this decision because it works well for us and because we think it will work well for you. But we understand that this is not the call you would make and that we're the ones who are making it and that you may be upset with us about it. Mm. We still think it's worth it, but we get it. Owning that, claiming that, not being defensive about that, I think helps kids move forward. I think it also models for them the ways that we want to handle themselves in their own conflicts and their own lives when things get tricky going forward. Being transparent, laying it all out there, and not trying to pull the wool over their eyes on something can buy you a lot of street cred. Is what it's the street cred that is it, right? I mean, that's the thing. Like, parent kids will feel in response to that, like, okay, you are making us move, but at least you're being honest with us about it, Mm. and and that's worth a lot. It's worth your relationship. Mm. That is what keeps us in good working relationship with our kids. Mm. You're not just flexing and telling me this is going to be great. You are acknowledging this is hard and you're acknowledging this is your call. And kids respect that and appreciate that. You know what I love about this episode? Most of the people listening today probably aren't in the process of moving, but there were so many fabulous threads in here that we could incorporate into daily family life that can make a difference on so many other levels. I hope so. I hope so. Absolutely. I absolutely believe it. Well, I'm counting down the days for summer. We've got a few more. we all? (laughs) (laughs) A few more weeks left to get us through the school year, but um, this has been great. Thank you so much, Lisa. I'll see you next week. I'll see you next week. 